Tom Barrick founded Capital, Connolly Capital back in 1990 with support from Robert Bass and GE Capital. And since then, he's grown it into a $22 billion company making investments around the world, largely in real estate, but increasingly in a diverse set of assets. We have the new CEO of Connolly Capital with us now to talk about his redirection of the company. And he is none other than Tom Barrick himself. So welcome back, Tom, as CEO. You never, quite, you never quite left. You were chairman. But, mm -hmm. but it's not just you took over as CEO again. You're redirecting the company. Tell us where you're going. Well, I, th I think where we're going is the, the same way the market is going. Right? If you look at, at hedge funds not performing well, especially this month, they're not performing well because the market is so efficient. So if, if you just took the top five stocks and invested in an index, you see what happens without a two and 20 structure. So real estate has undergone the same kind of unbelievable ride since 2008. And REITs, a public REIT, and by the way, we're almost 50 billion in assets, is supposed to be the passive recipient of income streams, right? No value added. The operating entities have to be someplace else. And it's supposed to be a patient contractual growth of, of income. The, the problem is in most asset classes in real estate, there's the devil named CapEx. So as you're growing a hotel segment or a healthcare segment or an industrial segment or an office building segment, and, and for instance, in New York City, CapEx always evaporates free cash flow. So what happened to us is the same thing. Um, as we matured in holding balance sheet assets, which we call balance sheet heavy, the yield on that sometimes is deceptive. Sometimes it looks as though it's return on capital, but it's return of capital. Hmm. So you have to go to a more actively managed format. And for us, that's asset light. The advantage of being public is you have a balance sheet. And the advantage of having a balance sheet is that you can take positions in value-added product, create a magic elixir over fixing that or creating better value, and sell those pieces off to third-party investors, which are primarily institutions who don't want to engage in, in, in that, that uh, process. So tell us about what happened. Do you go backwards before we go forward? I mean, uh, you did the big North Star deal, and the company has not done, I'm sure, what you would have liked to have done since that acquisition. Was that that North Star was in worse trouble than you thought it was? Everybody thought it was having some struggles. Was it that, or was it actually that the market moved on you and it went in a different direction? Both. We, we, we missed it. Uh, the, the, look, North Star, David Hamamoto was a terrific CEO, and he, he built a great platform, again, for what the market was at the time. That merger was much more complicated than we thought, bringing two cultures together. At the time, the retail market faded, the healthcare business got in trouble, and we just missed it. So today where we are, which is, which is a great opportunity for me, at a $7 stock is much different than a $14 stock, but the growth is in the asset management, investment management portion of the business where we're using that powerful balance sheet. We'll have $2 billion of liquidity. So with $2 billion of liquidity in these equity markets, leveraging that for third-party capital and fees is uh, exponentially better. 20% returns are better than 4% returns. <laughs> I mean, though asset managers have been creamed, it's been a really terrible uh, year. Uh, is it a buyer's market? Is it a seller's market? Like, how do you grow it? Did you go and just pick up companies that are going to fail anyway or that are uh, seeing a lot of outflows? Or how do you compete in an industry that is seeing outflows anywhere you look? Well, the buyout market, number one, there's a flood of liquidity, mm -hmm. right? And the markets are unbelievably efficient. So the buyout market is different. When you're, when you're buying a company 11 times and leveraging it seven times, mm -hmm. the idea is you're going to dividend back your equity very quickly. So it's a, it's a leverage play. What we're doing is, is something different. And the reason asset managers are, are, are behind the eight ball a bit is there's no value in the public markets for carry, for promote. We all used to live on promote, right? The business was not an asset management business. It was a total return business. So you buy an asset over a three-year period of closed-end funds. You uh, put management in and you recycle the company or the assets and you sell them in year five or year six. And the promotional interest of that was primarily the main consideration of that management group. Now today the market looks and says, we want long-term contractual fees and we'll give you a 15 times multiple on those fees. And of course, institutions are becoming smarter and better. Fees are coming down. They don't really like funds. They like co-investment. You have a smarter group of people in sovereign wealth funds. You have a smarter group of people in public and corporate pension funds. And they want to make investments directly 
with someone like us that has a balance sheet and say, we'll put 20% of our own capital side by side with you on a less fee intensive business. But um, it's hard to recreate a Blackstone. It's hard to recreate a Carlisle, an Apollo. Those entities that started in 1990 really were in search of themselves. It, they were deals. Now they've grown up into the lighter day investors and everybody will morph into something else, KKR. KKR uses a balance sheet. It uses a balance sheet very intelligently. You have a TPG that doesn't have a balance sheet and they're very intelligent. So it's this, this race for what is the next type of asset manager. But I think the market mistakes continuing contractual fees for promote. I would concentrate more on promote. The management teams that really want to make money are concentrated on the promote. As you just went through that litany, there's a lot of competition in this area. There are a lot of people trying to do this. What is your competitive advantage? What is it that you see in the marketplace that other people are missing? Well, our competitive advantage as a company is the balance sheet. So the, the closed end funds can only acquire assets within these commingled entities. So the, the breadth of, of how quickly they move is less. And the other thing is it's, it's a long line relationship business. Like, like all of these businesses, when you're relying on third party investors and shareholders, you gain reputational capital in, in tiny inches over decades and you lose it in an afternoon. So at a moment like this, it's a time to monetize, keep the dividend strong, uh, move to liquidity, there is going to be fissures that break in these markets, and when those fissures break, you take advantage of them in that marketplace without overpaying in an environment that's so efficient that it's priced to perfection. And I think that's what you see going on in these real estate markets is everybody's saying we're late in the cycle, we're late in the innings. You can't eat core FFO or AFFO, you only eat cash flow. So mm -hmm. how do you generate cash flow? And that's the difference. I think those will be the winners. The industry that you're describing would really lend itself to an activist investor at the end of the day to kind of clean it up. Anyone interested in Colony on an activist level? Not really. These, these are very difficult for activist investors because the assets go up and down in the elevator ad, every afternoon. So if you look, at, if you look at, at Blackstone, for instance, which has been the gold standard, um, and Steve Schwarzman and, and John Gray and Tony James have done a fantastic job, um, without them at the helm, to blend into another entity or consolidate or merge with, with another private equity firm doesn't make much sense because the assets really aren't on the balance sheet. The assets are on the, on the Christmas tree of the ornaments that are on the balance sheet. So I don't think anybody's very concerned about activism. There, there will be consolidation, there will, there will be, look, investor distribution and this liquidity market when you, when you see what happens to private equity, these institutions have to reach to private equity and real estate to match their actuarial returns. There's no way in a continuing market that they're gonna meet their actuarial returns. So let's talk uh, geography for a minute. Uh, on, on both ends, where will funds come from? Where you're looking for co-investors. Where will that come from? What parts of the world? And where will you be looking to invest assets into? So pu public pension funds in the U.S. have to continue to invest in alternative assets. That, that's a, a, a long process for them to decide where and how, and they're consolidating their managers. Sovereign wealth funds have become unbelievably sophisticated. Uh, QIA, the sovereign wealth fund of, of uh, Qatar at, at the top of the PIF in Saudi Arabia, which we've heard a lot about, Adia in Abu Dhabi, Tomasek, Capital Land, the, the Northern European countries, the Canadians are so good and so smart. The liquidity is epic. So you have done a fair amount of work in Qatar, I think it's fair to say. Given the relationship between Saudi Arabia right now and Qatar and the boycott, uh, the embargo. Can you do business on both sides of that boycott at the present time? Do you have to choose, not just you, Tom Barrick, but in general, does one have to choose between, on the one hand, being with the Qataris or being with the Saudis? No, look, I, I, I think look, the Middle East is a Rubik's Cube. And um, all of these young countries have brilliant young leaders who are trying to find their way in their own style. Qatar has done an amazing job since 1997. The leadership has been incredible. Uh, Sheikh Tamim, who is the emir there, is young, he's bright, he's Western educated, he's got a team around him that's incredible. The same in Abu Dhabi, Mohammed bin Zayed is the second generation of leadership. I mean, remember, the, we, we brought them out of the desert from trading mm -hmm. into this unbelievably incredible wealth cycle. 
So this tribal rivalry that they have is really regional. It's, it's, it's between them. My view of this has always been let them figure it out. Keep the U.S. out of this, this mess because there's no good answer. And I think what you'll see happen in the Middle East is if we allow them to resolve those issues themselves. They know that power in the Gulf is in alignment amongst them. You have this Sunni-Shia split. Uh, President Obama had a philosophy that Iran was the answer for us and moved closer to Iran, and President Trump has moved away from that and said the Sunnis are the answer. So the Sunnis now have aligned with Israel trying to get peace in Palestine. Jared Kushner has done a great job of trying to navigate these. Yeah. And I think you'll see the young leaders of Qatar, Abu Dhabi, and eventually Saudi Arabia align and say we needed a Gulf presence, and that Gulf presence is the only answer to stop Iran from doing something drastic. Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought up sort of uh, Saudi Arabia and sort of when you mentioned leave, let them figure it out and we're going to stay over here. It's hard to do that now with the Khashoggi affair. And we saw a lot of uh, business leaders not participate in, um, in the economic forum that they had, although now we hear that they still want to be invested. How do you handle that? What do you do? Is it change the way you want to be operating? Look, it's, it's very delicate. It's very delicate because Saudi Arabia is operating within a regime of their own legal system. And the regimes there that have been based on a monarchy, a monarchy based on succession to sons of one mother, the Suderi mother. In a, in, in a country which has 27 million people, 60% of which are below the age of 20, has to change. It has to change its tribal cadence. And it's been a raw, rugged, not corrupt country by their standards, but somewhat corrupt by our standards. It's just the method in which it worked. That takes bold, brutal action. And by the way, the, the boldness and the brutality is not something that is new for America. We have backed, starting with Saddam Hussein and the Shah of Iran and Gaddafi, mm -hmm. regimes that benefited us. So this, this resource curse, this oil and gas need that America had, really incented the West to make sure that there was imbalance in the region. It was our fault, not their fault. So the reaction to all this is going to take time and understanding and as, as the demands of the West become more dominant because we no longer need the oil. 10 million barrels of oil, by the way, in Saudi Arabia is significant. So I, th I think Mohammed bin Salman, for whatever trouble he's in and for this unbelievably heinous act that transpired, however transpired, has got to be fixed. But it's a sovereign country. So to say we're going to throw the country out because of the act of a group of people, whoever that is, I think is not feasible, and it's not feasible for the U.S. foreign policy. So, Tom, you know this area so well. You've done so much business over there. Let's come back to Colony Capital for a moment. Uh, to what extent is the future success of Colony Capital, as you are redirecting it, dependent upon Mohammed bin Salman and being able to deal with the sovereign wealth over, fund over there in PIF? Is that an important part of your future strategy? Well, look, it's all, uh, the macroeconomic environment is, is an important part of all of our strategy. It, we don't rely on anyone, but we have 357 investors in private funds, and they ebb and flow in, in what they need and what they want. But the region is unbelievably important. So my hope is that out of this, a redefined relationship of what are the requirements that we expect from Saudi Arabia? How do we blend Saudi Arabia and Qatar drop this blockade. How do we lessen airlift into Yemen, which none of us understand? Yeah. It's an opportunity. It's, it's, it's a problem and it's an opportunity. But for us, the flow of oil and gas from that region and the buildup of sovereign wealth funds that have no beneficiaries. So they don't have an actuarial hurdle like a CalPERS or a New York Common, which are saying I have to hit a 6% mm -hmm. return. So the diversification of their asset base is is much more expansive. So I think being smart, um, staying out of the political rhetoric, understanding the, 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 the patience of that system. In the Middle East, they, you know, they always talk about the IBM, inshallah bukur amalesh, uh, never mind, maybe tomorrow. <laughs> and I think that's the attitude that investors like us need to retain.